cover the page uh, 63. 63. Jesus. 
have been slaves in Egypt for a long, long time. <clears throat> now, remember that God called the Israelites his people, and he loved them. But the Pharaoh, what is a Pharaoh? A king. That's exactly right. He kept them as slaves, and he worked them hard. And God told the man, go to the Pharaoh and tell him, now my Wednesday night kids, you listen, okay? Go to the Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no, not going to happen. So God sent a plague, and he turned all the water in the land to blood. Is this ringing a bell with y'all? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so God says, go back. And tell him, let my people go. So the man did it. He went back and he said, Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, mm -mm, nope, not going to happen. So he sent a plague of frogs. What was this man's name? I know you know. Remember he went all those times. Pharaoh told him no. Said gnats and flies. Mo Mo Moses. Moses. <laughs> Finally, Pharaoh let the people go, and Moses was the leader, and he led them out of Egypt into freedom after they had been slaves all that time. So all right those Israelites slept, and they wandered around in the desert for years. But the first few months while they were wandering around, and they, if they were in the, were they in cars? No, no, they walked. They were walking, and they wandered around for a long time. And then they began to gripe, and they began to moan, and they began to complain, and they began to whine. God, you brought us out of Egypt to bring us into the desert to starve to death and die. God, we are so hot. We are so hot. We don't have anything to drink. God, why did you bring us out here for this? We were better off left in Egypt as slaves. Whining and complaining and grumbling. So God spoke to Moses and he said, <clears throat> okay, here's what I'm going to do. Every morning or every evening, I'm going to send little birds called quail. Have y'all ever eaten quail? We have them around here. They're little birds. And people hunt them, and they cook them and eat them. So God said, in the evenings, I'm going to send quail for you to eat. I want you to go out, and the campgrounds will be filled with quail, but only get what you need. Don't take more than what you need. And in the mornings, I'm going to, after the dew dries up and the land dries up, I'm going to send manna. Do you remember Bible trivia? What is manna? <coughs> So in the evenings, God would drop bread from heaven 
enough that everybody could get their fill. But remember, God said, don't take any more than you need. If you take more than you need, it's going to ruin overnight, and it's going to stink, and it's going to be filled with worms. Well, of course, there were some who didn't mind God. They didn't pay him any attention, and they got more than they needed, and overnight their, their food was full of and ruined and stink. So, boys and girls, why do you think that God did this for the Israelites? Why do you think, even after all the whining and complaining and the grumbling, why did God do that for the Israelites? They were God's chosen people. What else? Because he loved them. He loved them, and he gave them specific instructions to follow so that they would learn to trust God and know that God was going to take care of them. Boys and girls, when I was pastor today, I worked in an office, in a building, a three-story building. I was on the second floor. I was all by myself. No other offices were open. Five days a week, eight hours a day, I sat up there by myself, and I began to think, Lord, I can't do this. I can't sit up here by myself. I'm here all day long, all week long alone. I go home. I'm alone. I'm scared. I'm not in my right mind. I'm lonely. I'm depressed. I need another job to work. So I began to pray, Lord, I need a job that I can do the same thing every day because my mind, I couldn't concentrate. But I need a job, Lord, where I can do the same thing every day. I need a job, Father, where there are people that can teach me I can laugh again. I need a job, Lord, that are, that are Christian people around me that will love me and encourage me. Lord, I, I need a job that blah, blah, blah. I prayed about two weeks, and one day, sitting up in that lonely office, I get a phone call from Kim Hayes out of the State Hospital. And she says, Kathy, we have an opening. I didn't know Kim, but she knew me. And she called me and said, we have an opening in the accounting department. And in my mind, while she's talking, I'm going, Lord, I am so bad at numbers. I am so bad. And it's not just numbers, boys and girls. It is big numbers. And I thought, I will never be able to concentrate and do a job like that. I, I don't know that I can do this. And then I begin to think, you know, the Lord, the Lord has just dropped this job right in my lap. So I took the job. I applied. I got the job. But boys and girls, here's what happened. <clears throat> it was everything that I prayed about. Good people, good Christian people, women that taught me I could laugh again. They were patient with me while I tried to learn the job. But, you know, as I got into the job, I had to go behind the fence. And I began to hear all the people talking about their job, how they hated it, and how they didn't get paid enough, and how they, they just didn't want to be out there, and they wished they could find a better job, but they needed the insurance, and it was just complain, complain, complain. And you know what happened to me? I got pulled right into it. And I started complaining. And I started whining. And I was acting just like them. And one day as I was walking back outside of the fence, I thought, oh my gosh, I've become an Israelite. I've become an Israelite. I'm just like the Israelites. God has done all these good things for me, given a job that I prayed for, but here I am acting like an Israelite, whining and complaining. It really woke me up, boys and girls. What are some things that you complain about? Mm -hmm. Have you ever whined? What are you whining about? Hey, turn that TV off and get outside and do your chores. Feed the horses. <laughs> oh, man, I just turned on the show. I want to do the show. I don't ever get to do anything. I always have to work. I always have to work. We all complain, don't we? We all complain. And if you're not careful... You're going to be pulled into negativity. You're going to be pulled into whining and complaining, forgetting all the good things that God has done for us. Boys and girls, I don't want to be an Israelite. I don't want to be an Israelite. God has taken such good care of me all these years. He has loved me unmercifully. I didn't deserve it, but he loved me. And I want to trust him with every ounce of myself, with my heart and my mind. All of me, I want to trust him and love him, boys and girls. Now, sometimes life is hard. You probably haven't faced this yet, but life is going to get hard. And we forget all about the good stuff that God's done for us and that he gives us everything that we need. So when you catch yourself whining and complaining and carrying on, you stop. Stop and say, I don't want to be an Israelite. And you say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for me. Thank you. So you remember, catch yourself whining and complaining.
We thank you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, sometimes when life gets rough, we forget all the good things that you've done for us. And we begin to whine and complain. And when we do, Father, help us to remember that every good thing that we have came from you. Thank you, Father, for these children that you've put in my life. You knew, Lord, that I would need them way before I knew. Thank you for the joy that they bring to me and to their families and to their friends and to everyone around them. Father, you've given me a few that have given me a run for my money, but I love them, Lord. I love them just the same. Lord, I pray that this week that you would show up extra in their lives. Father, please, I pray that you would just show up and, and, and do something special for these kids to let them know how very much you care for them and how very much you love them. <coughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Denise and Travis both. Oh, did you bring some of those cupcakes for me? No, I love sweets. <laughs> no. What is the deal? Gosh. An anniversary. Okay, let's turn over to page 125.
Well, today as we continue through the series of Do Hard Things, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. And this is the story of Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac, or the almost sacrifice of Isaac. But what we see in this is a lot of stuff that makes us think about our own lives. And it makes us wonder if we're going to, you know, passing the test. Or will we pass the test when we are faced with these trials, when we're faced with these commands, when we're faced with these difficult decisions, this hard thing of what do I need to give up? Which makes me think of this question. And I want you to think on this question. And I want you to hold this question. I want you to write this question down. I want you to look at it and think about it a lot. And it's what do I hold as most prized that I need to give up to the Lord willingly? What do I hold that is most prized? We all have something. Every one of us have something that we hold as most prized. Maybe it's something that you've prayed long and hard for. Maybe it's something that God has blessed you with. Maybe it's something that God has given you that you desired, that you wanted so bad, and He finally blessed you with it. But now He's asking you to leave it behind. And that's what we have with Abraham. See, Abraham had received a great promise from the Lord many years before this narrative takes place. Abraham was 75 years old when God called him to go out from his country, his home, to this new land. And he told him, I will bless you. And you will have a son. And you will become a great nation. You will have all of these things. You will have it all. And Abraham trusted God. He was 75. And he waited 25 years for this son. 25 years. He waited and trusted God. We see him doing many things in that time frame. Yeah, he made some mistakes. He made some mess-ups. He did some wrong things. He didn't fully trust God all the way through. But we see in reading the story from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to this chapter, Abraham trusted God above all things. He committed to God. He believed in God. And he waited and waited and waited and God finally gave him this promised son. He has him. He is his. He was exceedingly happy. He had the son. He was living life. Everything was going as he thought was supposed to be. And it was clicking along. Because he had passed all the tests but one up to this point. One, he had passed the fellowship test when he gave Lot the pick of the land 
because they had become too big to stay together. That's in Genesis 13. And he passed the fight test to stand up and defend and take care of family in Genesis 14 when these other kings took over and took over these other towns and took Lot and all of them captive. Abraham went with a very small amount of men and whipped them all, took, it, took them out. He passed that test. And he passed the fortune test because he wasn't going to take the money when the king of Sodom says, here, keep it all. Everything you took back from those kings, you keep it, hold it. And he said no. And he gave a... 10% offering to Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem, and then get and told that king of Sodom, the men can keep some stuff, but I'm not going to keep anything because you will not say that you made me wealthy when God is the one who has provided. He passed that. He failed one test, though, when he went into Hagar to have a son instead of waiting on God. But then he gave a chance because he passed the farewell test when he sent Ishmael away even though it broke his heart. And now we're here with the story of Isaac. And this one speaks of the sacrifice that he's called to do of his son, his beloved son, your one son. And this is the hard test because here it is, the son that was promised. That said, this son will make you a great nation. You will have many. You will be big. The world will be blessed through the son. But then God says, I want you to sacrifice him up to me. See, God has placed Abraham in a contradiction. Think about it. This is the promised son. Through him, you are going to have all of these blessings, all of this nation, all of these wonderful things. All of this is going to happen because of this son. But then God says, I want you to bring him and offer him up to me. See, Tony Evans speaks of these contradictions because we find ourselves in these contradictions from God sometimes on a regular basis. We're blessed with something, but then he tells us to give it up. So what do we do? Here's what Tony Evans says, and I think this is very impactful. He said, if God places you in a contradiction that has no apparent solution, he alone must be trusted to resolve it. He alone must be trusted to resolve it. How often do we mess up everything because we are going to resolve it? We're going to fix this problem. I don't care what's happening. I'm going to fix it. I got this. I'm going to go in there and take care of it. Yeah, all I got is a claw hammer and a screw, but I'm going to go build that building. doesn't happen. we got to trust God. Rest in God. Let Him do it. And now also with this, we see Abraham, he looked to God. He was like, I can't do it. I trust you, God. And he didn't show any false obedience by just partially obeying God. By saying, okay, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it, and then kind of, and then just slowly going about it and all of that. No. And nor did he have the false obedience of delayed obedience. How often have we done that? We feel the call from God to do something and we're like, ah, oh, next week, next month, next year. Abraham immediately did it. There was no falseness to him. He acted on what God said because Abraham trusted God completely. He knew God is faithful. He knew God was going to fulfill the promises He said. And as you read in Hebrews 11, 17, verse 19, it tells us that Abraham believed that God would resurrect his son if he killed him. There was no such tellings of resurrections at this point. He had no clue of this. But he knew that God would resurrect because of two different reasons. If he was to take his son, one... Sarah was 90 years old, and he was 100 when they had Isaac. Well beyond childbearing years. So basically, he resurrected her womb to be able to carry a child. He knew that God made that promise, and that son would live. So he trusted God, and he went. That's what we need. We need that kind of faith. Because I'm telling you right now, there will be tests. That's what we see in this text. It tells us there will be tests. We all face them. We don't know exactly when or where they'll come, but what I can tell you right now is they absolutely will come. Tests are going to be there. Students in here all know all too well about tests. They come. You have to take them and you have to pass. But where is your faith? As we see with Abraham, his faith was big. It was bold and it was there. Because look, in Genesis 22, verses 1 through 2, what it says... If you have a Bible, turn to it. If not, use your phone, use something. I don't have them on the screen today. But he says, 
After these things, which was all of the stuff that culminated up to this point, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Abraham was ready, willing, right there. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, that's quite the test, isn't it? That is a brutal test. That is a hard test. That is a difficult test. He was tested to the max. Take your son. But Abraham faced it with strength. Even though he may have struggled within. There's nothing in here that says that maybe he didn't wonder inside. Like, man, this is going to be hard. No, he just went. He faced it and took it. And the thing is, we're going to struggle too like that with tests. We're going to have battles with it. We're going to have problems to face those tests. They're going to be hard. Tests are not easy. They're not meant to be easy. If tests were meant to be easy, they wouldn't be a test. Tests will try you because tests prove you. Tests make you. Tests show what you really are inside. That's why you take them. You have to have tests or you will never grow and mature. And Abraham was tested to the max right here. And his faith shone big and bold because he immediately acted. He didn't wait. He waited for years for this child, but as soon as God said, here, bring him to me, he acted. He didn't hide it. He didn't hold back. He didn't fight against it. He didn't question why. He didn't nothing. He just did it because he knows God is more faithful. So that leads to a question. What is it in your life that you have waited on for years that you finally now have that may be taking your focus from God? See, God gave Abraham this child. He gave him many years with him. Because obviously here in a minute, because he carries the wood, he was an older child, he wasn't young. He was able to carry the wood up the mountain. He gave him this child, and Abraham had him. So God was testing him to see if he had put this child above him. So the question is, do you have something that God has finally given you? Land, job, money, family, sports, hunting, all of that stuff, any of that can become a God to you if you allow it. Any of that could be something that God has blessed you with. I know one time I prayed for years. All I wanted was some land and some cattle of my own before I turned 35. And guess what? By 2016, God had blessed me with it. I had land and I had some cattle. And it turned into a nightmare. The blessing was a nightmare. It wound up causing me more grief, more struggle, more work, more time consumed and all of this stuff than I was able to do. He's like, here's your blessing. And then I had the opportunity to get out. And I was like, do I want my ego to stay in the way? Do I want to keep holding on to this? Or am I going to give it up so I can serve God more? Well, I gave it up. He'll test you in many ways. He'll give you what you want sometimes, but then he'll ask you to give it back. To prove you. To prove if your faith is there. As we read in James 2.21, but Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. He was proven faithful because he followed God. He obeyed God. He did what he was supposed to. He trusted him. Instead of clinging to the blessing, he gave back the blessing to the blesser. And that's what God desires of us. It's hard. Yes, that's why I'm saying this is do hard things. It's not easy to give things up that you have wanted forever. But sometimes that's what we have to do. These challenges are there. And the only way that we can do that, the only way we can give up these hard things and do this and give it back to God is to focus on promises, not explanations. Abraham remembered the promise. And we see here in three verse, three, verse 3 through 5, and we see that Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. He rose and loaded immediately, did all of that. No questions asked, no complaints raised, nothing against God, nothing like that. He went immediately and traveled three days. Three days. Three days to think about this. It wasn't like right here and right now. Three days. Not only that, but it gives a very detailed story of how he loaded this, got this, did that, packed and put, and did all of these things. And that shows us that tests are not something that happen and are over with quickly. 
shows us that tests might last for a good bit of time. Tests might cling on to us for an extended time frame. And are we going to focus on the promises or seek explanation? Are we going to ask God, why me? Because when we ask God, why me? Rather than saying, okay, God, I don't understand why you are doing this and what will come from it, but I know you are a good and great God who delivers what he has said, so I trust you. Because when we ask God, we betray that our faith in the Lord is only skin deep. Instead of trusting and focusing on the promises and we start questioning, where's our faith? Where's our faith? Now, we don't understand. We don't have an idea all the time. We can't see the big picture like I've said before up here. It's like a tapestry. We can only see the backside of it with all the knots, the weaves, and the bobs, and all of that. But God sees the beautiful picture on the other side. So when we ask why, we're not trusting our God. We need to trust Him. And maybe you're struggling with that today. Maybe you're trying to hold on to something rather than giving it to God and trusting Him. Maybe you have that battle. Maybe you're fighting to give something up. Maybe you're holding on to a so-called freedom where you go and spend six days doing whatever you want and then just show up on Sunday morning hoping that'll cover all the damage done during the week. Maybe that's something you're doing. I don't know. There's a lot of people out there that think that way. Maybe it's wealth that you're holding on to. You're just clinging to it and you're hoarding and laying back a job that you need to give up because it's destroying you. But you keep holding on to it because that paycheck is so good. But it's devastating you. Maybe it's something like that. I don't know. But what I'm saying is you've been blessed, but God may be calling you to something higher and better if you will just let it go. There's a lot to that. So there's so many things that can take away your time and conceive or just, just destroy you. As James says, that sin, all of that stuff becomes a God and sin grows up in you and it conceives and then it grows, becomes full grown to death is all it'll do. Are you giving these things up? Or are you holding on? Are you seeking explanations rather than trusting God? Are you trusting Him or wanting explanations? Are you being like Job who was... Desiring all this time in front of God, wanting to talk to God, wanting to defend his case, wanting to ask why, wanting to do all of these things. Well, let me tell you what happened to Job. God spoke to him. In Job 38 through 41, let me give you a very brief and paraphrased version of it. It's like, who are you to question me? Were you around when I created? Were you there when I made all of this and laid the foundations and made it all happen? Were you there? So who are you to question me? That's the answer Job gets for the reason why all of his sufferings happen. That's the answer we get in the book of Job. Sufferings happen. Pain is there. It's real and it's there. But why? Who are we to ask God why? Instead of saying, God, I don't get it. You got a reason. I don't understand it. I don't know why I'm supposed to bring my kid and sacrifice him to you. I don't know why I'm supposed to give up all this money. I don't know why I'm supposed to give up this land. I don't know why this needs to be. I don't know why this was taken from me. I don't understand all of these things that have happened, God, but you do. I trust you. Give me the strength to keep walking through this. That's what we need to do. Because when we go to questioning, we're not seeking the wisdom that comes from it. We're wanting a quick out. That's the problem. And we're not depending on God because when we focus on the promises, we depend on God to provide. He will provide. Look at verses 5, 8, and 13. They read, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Verse 8. When asked by Isaac about the lamb, all right, this is where he's at, about the lamb for the sacrifice, Abraham said, God will provide. And if you read it in the Hebrew, it can read actually, God is providing for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. He trusted. So they both went together. And then in 13, Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. In those verses, we see that Abraham had complete and total full trust that God would provide. Verse 5, we will return. We're coming back. He knew his son wasn't going to be dead. He knew they were coming back. 
He knew God was going to provide the sacrifice. He knew this. And I want to tell you, you too can trust that same thing because God has provided the lamb for the sacrifice. We read this in John 1.29 about Jesus who came and died in our stead. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God provided that. Do you not think He'll provide for everything else? Do you not think He will cover in these things that you keep clinging and holding on to instead of giving up? He's provided. We just have to trust Him. Your life, trust Him. Your finances, trust Him. Your homes, your vehicles, all of your things, trust Him. We have to trust Him. If you're in the agricultural business, you trust Him all day long, every day, because by golly, you can't make it rain. You have to trust Him because nothing is going to change. You have to trust Him because He is the one who gives us every good blessing. He is the one whose grace is abundantly above and beyond all we can imagine. God has provided the Lamb. He has provided all things for us. We see His amazing grace everywhere. If you just look, you see it. But we still struggle to trust Him. Matthew 6, He spoke of talking about how the birds of the air are provided for and they don't work or toil, but they're there. They have what they need. The lilies of the field, they grow and spend all their beauty and they don't do anything for it, but God provides and gives it to them. Let me tell you, it says in the book of Psalms that He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He created everything. He made everything. He owns everything. It is all His. Have we sought Him and tried to tap into His glory by giving Him honor and praise and asking Him to bring blessings upon all people? No. We get too focused sometimes on what we want. God has it, but do we trust Him to provide it? Do we trust Him is the question we need to ask. You know, yeah, you have things. You've put a lot, you know, you maybe you've put a lot together in your lifetime. You've worked hard for it and you've earned it. But let me tell you, God is the one that blessed you with the ability to work like that. God is the one who gave you the air. He's the one that provided the food. He's the one that provided the work. He's the one that provided the rain. He's the one that provided all things. He gave you the abilities, the gifts, the skills, the knowledge, and the wisdom to do what you do, to get what you have. Because without Him, you'd have none of it. We need to trust Him because He's already provided it's all Him. And we need to trust Him rather than hoard things. We need to be more open and trusting. Because if not, we say to Him, you may have created everything and made all the things I have, but I know more about how I need to live and get by than you do. If we're not trusting Him to provide, we're telling Him we know more than He does. That's why Abraham was immediate in his faith. He knew God was faithful. He knew God would provide. He knew God would do all He said He would do. And he went. He trusted. God will provide. God is providing. And God has provided. God is in all tenses. Past, present, future. He's there everywhere. Now the question is, will we pass the test? Will we pass the test and do the hard thing? Will we trust God? Do we trust God enough to stop for a few hours and stop getting and getting so much? Do we trust God enough to just give up some things? Do we trust Him to give more, serve more, be more obedient? Do we? Because when we do, we seek to honor the Lord, which is what Abraham was doing. He was faithfully honoring God is what we see because in verses 15-19, through 19, we see that the angel of the Lord appears and calls to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will... Surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven as the sand that is on the seashore. And it goes on and speaks of that of all these blessings. Abraham already had these blessings, but God reaffirms these blessings. Now I'm not saying that you're going to get these kind of blessings. You're not going to have this. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you're going to have all this material blessing and all this wonderful stuff in the world like that. But what I'm telling you is when you seek to honor God, when you follow God, when you faithfully serve Him, when you commit to Him, you will have blessings in heaven beyond your wildest imagination. And He may bless you here. But I want to tell you, you're blessed every day. Every single day you're blessed because you have life. 
you have a chance to tell more people about Christ and cause them to see the beauty and the glory of Him. You know, we walk around with a glum face and all bitter and pouty and mad because things haven't gone the way they're supposed to. Who's going to believe that you're truly trusting Christ? You know, you walk up to somebody with a mad face on, you know, like you're ready to just murder everything around you, and you tell them, let me tell you about the joy I have in Jesus Christ. They're going to go, what the heck is wrong with you, you psycho? But when we are fully trusting Him, we can walk up to people and share those blessings. Because I'm telling you, the greatest blessing to ever have in your life is when you're speaking to somebody and they believe in Christ. There's no money or nothing in this world that compares to that. Because you had an involvement in God's glorious work. That is the beauty of it. So trusting God, trusting in these blessings, and trusting in all of that gives us some comfort because we will be reigning with Christ. We'll be ruling with Him because we've served Him and committed to Him and receiving this great honor from Him. Just think, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is going to let you co-reign with Him. That blows out every treasure on this earth, in my opinion. I don't care if I'm just ruling over a little swamp plan. If I'm ruling with Christ, I'm ruling with Christ. There's nothing compares. Nothing. So I want you to know that tests show our obedience and has us be approved. If you're obedient, you will be approved. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15 about that. You know, we'll be a workman who has no need to be ashamed. Because as Bruce Waltke says about it, he says, God does not test us to lead us into sin, but to test the quality of who we are. And when we do that, we will learn that following God's will may entail suffering, waiting, and even dying, but if it is His will, we must bow down to it and accept it with thanksgiving. Hard, huh? But if it's His will, who are we to say no? Who are we to deny Him? Who are we to say, I'm done, I'm done. You made everything. You got the power to snuff me out any second you want, but I know more than you do. Anytime we argue with God, that's what we're saying. Think about it. When your kids argue with you, what is the first thing you do or did? Hush. You don't know what you're talking about. That's what God is like to us. It's like, just hush. Just hush. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. And when we do, we'll have a deeper love for Him. When we do, we will see how beautiful and awesome and amazing and glorious He truly is when we just stop talking and trust Him. But man, we want answers, don't we? Oh, we want answers. And there's some answers that we just will not have. There are just some things that we will never, ever know until we're with Him in, a, in glory. And guess what? Even then, we may not know. And guess what? More than likely, you know, we all talk about all oh, these questions I have when I get there. Oh boy, I want to ask this, I want to ask that. But more than likely, when we get there, we're going to be going, I don't care about those answers. Look where I am. This is awesome. So living like this and doing the hard things and trusting God, not questioning Him and not doing all that, shows that we have faith above fear. Faith above our desires. Faith above all material things. And this means faith equals trust, which equals a blessed walk, which means faith equals fearing God over all things. When we fear God over all things, when we fear Him over everything there is, there is nothing that can do anything to us because we have God, we fear Him, who cares what you do to me? Take me out, do whatever you want. I trust God, I don't care. We will have amazing faith, just as Abraham had. And I'm telling you, again, we will face many trials. We will face many tests. It's not an if, it's a when, and how bad. Just like cowboy, and it's not if you get hurt, it's a when, and how bad, and how often. Because it happens. It's going to happen. 
Same with tests. They're coming. But they strengthen our worship. They make us bow down to the Lord completely. They cause us to give Him everything. They cause us to acknowledge that His will is best and far above anything we could ever think. It's what we see with Abraham. He gave praise to God. He trusted God. He was a proven workman who is known as a friend of God because he was fully trusting. And when we do that, we'll have a realization that we're kind of like this bar of steel that's worth about five bucks. All right? Horseshoe world, you get that bar of steel, you shape it out, you have horseshoes worth about ten bucks. All right? Well, then you take it and you manufacture it into needles. All right? They take that same steel, they turn it into needles. It's worth about $350. Now you take that same steel and you turn it into a bunch of springs for watches. It becomes worth about $250,000. So that same bar of steel is made more valuable by being cut to its proper size, passed through one blast furnace after another, again and again, hammered and manipulated, beaten and pounded, finished and polished until it's ready for those delicate tasks. That is what tests do to us. That is what doing the hard things will do to us. It will take us and put us and place us where we're supposed to be. It'll make us more mature, faithful followers of Christ. Abraham faced the test. So will we. Abraham focused on the promises of God. So can we. Abraham depended on God to provide. We can too, because he already has. Abraham knew honoring God was number one priority. And we too can live this way. You know why I know we can live this way? Because we have something Abraham didn't have. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We have the power of God Almighty Himself inside us. We have that ability so we can pass the test. We can stand faithful. We can trust God and look to His promises because God has given us the ability to do so because He has given us His Holy Spirit. It's not you being able to do it. It's God in us. That's how we do it. We trust Him. And we can pass the test when we allow our Savior to work through us. So again, I ask this question. What do I hold as most prized that I need to give up to the Lord willingly? And as my final thing, I'll say mine was education. I was seeking that higher academic. I was seeking that. You know why? I wanted it. I wanted the clout. I wanted those letters by my name. Yeah, I finished my master's. It's over with. I'm done. And God told me, you need to take a break and wait. Maybe He's telling you the same thing. And I haven't asked why. Yeah, you want to know what? There's been some days I sit there and look and wonder. But I trust God. So what do you hold that you need to give up to Him? What is it you hold that you need to lay at His feet? What is it that He's blessed you with that maybe you're taking to an extreme? We all need to lay things down at His feet and trust Him, every one of us. And I pray that you too will pass the test. And I know you can pass the test because I know if you have believed in Jesus Christ, you have that Holy Spirit inside you. And you can do this. You can do hard things. And I know you can. I've seen you do it. I've seen many of you do it. I know stories of some of you. I know things. You can do hard things. Jesus Christ is powerful enough to carry you through. Trust Him. Trust Him. And you will do hard things. You will. Not a doubt in my mind. Larry, would you close us in prayer? Most gracious heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts. Thankful for the opportunity to present us to reach salvation and trust in you and have a home in this life after we lift up the people who are lost and trying to figure things out. May they reach a solution that's beneficial to them to draw them closer to you, Savior. I pray for our church members and our community folks who are sick or have lost loved ones, comfort them, heal the sick, and be thy will, dear Father. 
go with us this coming week. Give you all the praise in your holy name. Amen. Y'all have a blessed week. I'll see you this Wednesday or next Sunday. Be blessed.